Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Happy Friday. Uh, we hope that you are uh, healthy and safe wherever you are in the world today. And maybe you're watching us on Facebook. Maybe you're here in Zoom with us. Um, but we're happy to have you here. And we think that our Friday actionable innovations conversations are a really great way to end your week and to kind of think about education and innovation. Um, my name is Lucy Gray, and um, I'm the co-founder of Actionable Innovations, along with Don Buckley and Bill Rankin and a bunch of other people. And uh, we're really happy to have you here today. What we do is we are an inclusive professional learning community. Uh, we want to support and inspire education leaders. We host conversations and connect people in conversations like today. And we also write on Medium about global education innovations in general. We are um, um, we started last fall and merged with another group that I started called the Global Education Conference Network. And that conference that was from um, that network is going to uh, be re resurrected next November. So we're really excited to kind of combine two communities together. And now we're known as Actionable Innovations Global. And we hope that you'll uh, participate and, and join in our, our activities. Um, if you want to get more involved, you can find me at Lucy at Lucy Gray Consulting .com. You can also enjoy, uh, join our community where we have resources and all sorts of other goodies um, around global education and innovation. Um, and you can join it at, at actionableinnovations.global. Um, you can also follow us on social media at linktree slash actionable inno and you will find the links to our youtube channel where this recording will be um probably tonight uh along with other other resources as well so linktree uh slash actionable inno will take you to where all of our uh important links are um today during today's conversation we want you to introduce yourself in the chat tell us who you are where you're from uh, what your role is, and if you want to include your Twitter handle or LinkedIn profile, this is a really great opportunity to kind of network and get to know other people that are like-minded. So throw that stuff into the chat um, if you'd like to. And then uh, we use the hashtag GlobalEd22, and you're more than um, you're more than uh, welcome to use that too and t tweet out any insights or invite people into this, whatever you want to do. And then the only thing that we ask is that when you're not speaking, just make sure that your mic is muted so that we don't have a ton of background noise going on during the conversation. Um, we're going to start out with an interview with, uh, with our guest today, and then we'll, have, we'll do Q&A. But you can always uh, drop questions into the chat whenever um, they come to you as well. And we, we can always go back to them or try to answer them as we see them. So um, I'm so excited today to bring you um, somebody who's been a friend of mine for a long time, it seems like now. And Alex Inman, we welcome you. Hi, how are you? Hi, thanks so much for having me. Yeah. And Alex is, um, I tweeted out earlier, he's one of the smartest, uh, nicest, funniest people I know in the ed tech world. And he has been um, I, I subscribe to the belief that together we do more and that it's, it's, it's important to be professionally generous to others. And he exemplifies that. He has always been incredibly kind to me. And in all transparency, I've done work for Alex as part of his educational collaborators group, as have other people, I think, in the, in the room. I think Julian's coming, so she should be here. I think maybe Alex has, has done some work for you too, Alex. I'm not, Alex P. Um, I'm still but, working on that. <laughs> okay, I'm still working on that. Okay, so there might be people here who who've been part of your group. And Alex is uh, a longtime educator, the founder of this great consulting group called Educational Collaborators that he has built over the years, and he's going to tell us more about that. And in addition to that, he's now the chief academic officer for SDS Education, which is based out of California. You can follow him on these various different handles, Alex or. Uh, educational collaborators or STS's handle. Um, let's give them some Twitter love and follow them back if we can uh, follow them so that they we can add to their numbers, our, our teeny group here. Um, but Alex, we're so happy to have you here. And I'm going to let um, 
uh, Don take over here and and do the next part of our our torture, which is um, the Proust. Well, it's not Proust. It's the Proust questionnaire. Uh, and Don, uh, do you want to share a little bit about the history of uh, the Proust questionnaire? And I'll stop sharing. So, if you're a reader of Vanity Fair, like I am, amongst many of the many magazines I read, you turn to the back page every month. There's a questionnaire. Um, which was designed by um, Marcel Proust, and they use it to interview uh, celebrities. Um, but if you haven't been on the show before with us, the Proust questionnaire is a set of questions answered by the French writer Marcel Proust, um, and sometimes used by interviewers today, e.g. me. Uh, Proust answered the questions in a form of confession book album, a form of parlor game popular in Victorian times. And so I've taken them and I've adapted them for education. And um, they're very, um, what I find, Alex, is um, they're just great opening questions to get everyone in the right frame of mind for the rest of the show. So, um, and people on, if anyone else here, please feel free to answer the same question as I'm going to ask Alex in the chat. And if anyone wants to see mine, they're all on Don Buckley Medium, the Proust. Proust questionnaire. I would never try out anything except I'm doing it on myself first. That's I always do that as an educator. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so please answer in the questionnaire and let's um, collaborate with, with Alex here. Okay, Alex, here we go. Um, question one, uh, what educator do you most identify with? Um, <clears throat> educator I probably most uh, identify with would be um, um, Diane Laufenberg. Ah, uh, yeah. I, she. Um, I'm not saying I consider myself there. I'm just saying I I identify. I'm that she is. Uh, she has a level of sincerity and genuineness to everything that she does. Um, and I, I, I think that is, is probably what I would seek to do most in, in what I do is I, I try to be, um, you know, genuinely responsive to the, to the needs around me. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would, I put her as somebody that I would identify with not again, not attain, identify. <laughs> No, um, I, I know Diane, Alex, and I think you've described her to a T. She is so grounded and real and honest. Absolutely. Yeah, she's amazing. Um, anyone, in, did, did we have anyone in the chat? I, I, I identify with David Kelly and like what you said about Diane, I'm nowhere near the caliber that he's the founder of the D School, but he's the educator that I absolutely think is amazing. Um, did we get any other response in the chat, Lucy? I, well, just me because I'm always saying the same okay. thing. I'm usually I'm usually saying some version of a fictional character. Like uh, yeah. I love Anna Green Gables books from when I was a kid. And if you ever saw the Canadian broadcasting um, TV series from like 30 years ago, um, I, you know, Anne grows up to be a teacher, and she also has a teacher that's very inspirational to her, named Miss Stacy. So I want to be that person. I guess I don't know. Um, but that's for me personally. And then Diana, I'm not sure if everybody here knows who Diana is. So, uh, Mr. Cotter works, Alex. <laughs> um, oh, I like that. Uh, Mr. Cotter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what about, uh, so Diana, um, if you, if you're not familiar with Diana, Diana is one of the founding teachers at, at Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia. Uh, and you guys should look her up and follow her on Twitter. And she's always off on some sort of interesting in adventure. Um, and she has a, a, she, she lives in Northern Wisconsin and I love her, her pictures on Facebook of where she is and what she's doing, um, in that neck of the woods. And she has a dog too, that is, should be, you know, I feel like should be like in a, a character in a book or something. Um, but she, <laughs> she's, she's a, she's an awesome human being. Uh, okay. Oh, Miss okay. Frizzle for Stephanie. That's a good one. Oh. Okay, I'll go on to the second question for Alex. And please, everyone in the chat, if you want to jump in. Um, okay, Alex, so which words or phrases uh, do you most overuse? Oh, that one's easy. <laughs> I overuse the word collaborate like 
like crazy. I mean, the company is called Educational Collaborators. I It's called that because I so deeply believe in high quality collaboration. Uh, I, I our, our logo is a takeoff on synergy, which is fundamentally collaboration. It's uh, like I, I'm a total collaboration dork and I drive people crazy with my excessive use of the word. <laughs> <laughs> Did we get anyone else, any other brave person telling us they're overused words? Mine being amplify, I tend to use it every fourth sentence. I, I think collab you could we could do like a mad libs with these words like you know how do you collaborify and how do you how do you co collaborate and amplify um, <laughs> yeah, collaborify. <laughs> um you know i think i say groovy too much and and i also say i have a tendency to say to people like for affirmation i go right or <laughs> yeah and do you know yeah you know, something like something like that but um yeah my affirmation is always i hear you Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. And I, I lead most questions that are difficult with "help me understand," mm -hmm. which is a nice ease into things. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, Alex. Here we go, and the rest of the audience too. Um, <laughs> I like Stephanie's. <laughs> what does she say? She says, and, and she puts and quote, "That's awesome." <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, let's see. Okay, Alex, what talent would you most like to have? Well, uh, let's see. <clears throat> Does it have to be like a real talent or can I like fly or have x-ray vision or something like that? You totally can because mine is predict the future. Oh, that's, well, that's a really good one. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, I, I suppose this could be a real talent, though it's becoming harder and harder in, in the world. And it's funny that you used the, the phrase, Don, uh, help me understand. I, I think actually right now, if I could have a talent, it would be to help everyone understand others, right? There's so much uh, narrow thinking going on in the world right now and inability to listen and truly understand others. Yeah, if I could have a talent, it would be to sort of wave a wand and have everyone really, really understand one another. Right. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> hey, you know, I got that. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, Lucy and I've had many con conversations. In a way, yeah, I think it's we've we've stooped to the lowest common denominator, I feel, in, in the, the work that I see going on in schools. Um, it's, it's just still shocking um, how people, it's obvious people are not comfortable with ambiguity. We're in ambiguity. We're going to be here for a while. And still, a lot of people aren't ready to still navigate it. And I mean, if we could, if I could get them that superpower to people, I would be happy. Um, but yeah, Alex, I definitely agree with you. Um, anyone else in the chat? Did they fire in something? No. Alex P. Alex P. is saying the gift of clarity, the being able mm -hmm. to speak in a way that people will hear, um, and convince. That I I I think that as I think as as tech people in schools, I think that's something that we always are striving for <laughs> is to have that um, have that uh, respected voice, right? That people will listen to and act upon. It's always kind of a a challenge sometimes. So I I I can. I can commiserate with that as well. I think for me, um, if I could have a secret talent, I would like something simple. I would like, I would, I love, I wish I could perform. I wish I could be um, a singer or dancer or actor or something along those lines. I have no talent whatsoever in any of those areas. Um, but I think it's like, I think it's amazing to watch people who do, who can kind of turn that stuff on. And then in the more realistic uh, um, realm, I would love to be able to be like a really superior keynote speaker. Like I, there's some people out there who are just so gifted with their slide design and, and that sort of thing. I wish I could have the whole package of, of being able to talk and perform and design a, a learning experience for others that's powerful. Right, okay. Um, okay, last one, Alex. 
What is your favorite hero fiction? Um, that one is a tough one. I, I'm not sure I'd stick with this answer with, with more thought, but um, an interesting one that sort of popped into my head, and maybe this is because of the Diane comment, but um, uh, is uh, Atticus Finch. Um, so, and it, and it kind of, uh, it resonates with my uh, sort of approach to consulting. Um, there are a lot of people who sort of call for radical change when they see something that's, that's wrong. And, and uh, though I would love to hop on that bus and ride that all the way across town, I don't know that that creates the kind of sustainability that, um, that we need. And so Atticus is somebody who sees wrong, knows wrong, fights against wrong, but does so within the systems that exist to make sure that those changes stick. And, um, and, and, and we try to do the same when we're working with schools that are struggling with, with needs to make change is uh, do that, but do that in the way that is you so that it becomes you, your new you. Um, as opposed to something that is now completely other than who you previously identified as, as you. Right. That's great. Th thanks, Alex. And th Alex, thank you for humoring me and taking us through our Proust questionnaire. And I'm going to pass it back over to Lucy, who is taking over from here. Thanks again, Alex. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> oh, Lucy, you're, you're muted. And wouldn't it be great if we all had a nickel for every time we said that over the last two years? <laughs> we would all be rich. <laughs> I, know, I know, I know, totally. I know, even after all this time of using Zoom, you would think I would know better by now. Uh, so you made it through the Proust gone. That would yeah, be the ahead, superpower, Alex. the ability to speak and have mute <laughs> automatically come off. <laughs> right? yeah. and you, you would think that they would have figured it out by now, because if I wave, like if I'm on, on certain devices on, on Zoom, it will, if I wave my arms, it will raise my hand. Like there's some sort of interactive thing now with it. So you would think that there would be some sort of gesture that it would recognize that would help you unmute. That would like be brilliant if they did that. Um, but there's so many cool things going on with Zoom. Maybe they will come out with that one of these days and who knows. Um, so I, I wanted to start out today, Alex, by saying thanks again for coming and taking the time mm -hmm. to be here. And one of the themes that's been coming through in our conversations with people is kind of their entrepreneurial journeys. Um, how I don't think people necessarily set out to be entrepreneurs, but they definitely have had entrepreneurial thinking driving their work um, to a certain extent. And I thought maybe we'd start out by just telling you guys, telling us your journey a little bit about from, from educator to founder to now chief academic officer. Yeah, it, um, <clears throat> I mean, I've always had kind of an entrepreneurial bug, just a, a little bit, but never really an interest to get into uh, into business. Um, I did initially go to college to to create educational film and television, not to become a teacher. Um, but I felt it was really important. You know, Don mentioned earlier that he's gone through these questions himself because it's it, it, it's important for him to experience that which he wants to speak of and do. And, uh, and so I felt like before I could become an educational film and television producer that I should become a teacher. And so, um, so I got a teacher certificate in college and then the internet came out in when I was in what, when I was an undergrad and I was like, Whoa, I, I, I mean, it didn't come out, it became public. Right. And so I'm not that old. I mean, it was created in like the sixties. It was, but, but it went public in the nineties. And, and I looked at this and I was like, Whoa, this is, this is better than film and television, right? Like this is, this is nonlinear. It's more broadly distributed. It's more personalized. And this new technology offered so much more than what, than the medium that I was studying in order to to, to teach with. And so, so I was looking for jobs after college in, in this field and they, they like did not exist. And so I had, you know, college loans that I needed to pay and I needed to eat. And, 
and I was actually homeless for three months after college, but that's a whole other story. Um, and uh, it was great stories actually, but the, um, uh, but not good living. Anyways, um, I, a high school offered me a job as their debate coach and their technology lab coordinator, right? Like they, they hired me to be a debate coach, but this particular school debate was sort of like football in Oklahoma or Texas. They're like, if you're a good coach, like they're going to hire you. What else can you do? Right? Like if you're the football coach, you're like anywhere from the janitor to like the assistant superintendent, like they will find you a job. And, and so the principal literally asked me, do you do computers? And I didn't really, but I used computers when I edited and I needed a job. And I figured if he was going to ask the question, like, do you do computers? He wouldn't know if I was lying in my answer. So I said, yes, I do. And I became a lab coordinator at a high school in Milwaukee and their debate coach. So, and I am getting to your answer. <clears throat> I actually started a, my first, educational collaborators was not my first company. It was actually my second company. So the first company that I started was an online summer debate institute called summerdebate.com. And this was back when Blackboard was brand, brand new. And you could stand up a class for like a hundred bucks and, uh, and then, and then use, use Blackboard. Uh, pretty much it was an unlimited license for a hundred dollars. So my, my high school debate students were going to these debate camps at like Emory, Northwestern, University of Michigan, Stanford, and they were extremely expensive, like $8,000 for like a four week program, right? And, and this is in the 90s. That's a, that's a, I don't spend $8,000 on my kids on summer camp now, like back in the 90s, that's some serious money. And so I thought there's got to be a better way. And I sent kids to all of these camps. So I got to know the faculty at all of these different debate camps. And so what I thought I could do was help out all those kids who couldn't afford this crazy amount of money to go to these debate camps. And I, and I went and I hired the top lecturers at all of those debate camps and had them put together a virtual curriculum. And the requirement was, instead of a separate work cited, they had to embed the, the links to all of their works within their lectures, right? So that they became live hyperlinkable lectures. And then um, video, you couldn't really do video very well back then. Streaming was not really an option. And so we, we would do like recorded video lectures and recorded practices um, that then were then files that you would upload, then you would download, then you would watch, then you would send back your comments. And it was kind of kludgy, but it's what the internet offered back then. But it was a way for me to offer the equivalent of a four-week program curriculum for $200, I think, or something like that is what I offered. And so it was you know, less than one-tenth of what a lot of people were paying with the best faculty in the country. And so it did that for a while. Then I stopped being a debate coach. It got very, very difficult to keep all that stuff up. I sold it to Planet Debate, which was a project out of Harvard's team. And, um, and I made enough money in my first business to buy a television. Not actually all of a television, but like 80% of a television. It had HDTV tuner on it. It was sweet. Um, and that was my first massive venture. Um, uh, then about four years later, I was doing some uh, subject matter consulting for IBM Global Services, and we were starting the school. And I had, Intel had funded a project with IBM Global Services with my school, and I knew how much this, th these guys cost. And so even though I was not a very well paid, um, you know, consultant, they still brought me in as a subject matter expert to these things. And I met the schools and, um, and, and I was just kind of enamored with this, but I noticed that the school actually was more interested in the subject matter experts than in the big high powered, you know, super people. And it resonated with my experience as a tech director. I'm like all these people who had not been in classrooms in like 10 years, five years, they weren't relevant to my teachers. And so I thought, huh, you know, it'd be great if there were six of me to be one, you know, it would take six of me to be a, a consultant and keep my job. And so I thought maybe I should do that. And so over a Thanksgiving break, I stood up a Linux server and called five friends and 
the six of us became like the equivalent of one consultant while we all worked full-time in school. And that's how I started educational collaborators. And that was 15 years ago. And I just sold the company and now I'm part of a bigger company that does more with education. And, uh, and so that's my journey. I had no idea about half of uh, the first half of that, really. I had no idea. And I love it. Cause I mean, like you were virtual, and asynchronous with your delivery of debate content before way before it was cool to do that and and so what year was that out of curiosity your your debate uh, year let's see it had to have been like uh see i started the one to one program in 99 so somewhere in somewhere around 99 or 2000 it'd probably be okay. I, I, I should look up when blackboard started because it was probably right around then so oh no okay. Wait, I started my one-to-one -one program. No, I'm sorry. It was earlier than that. Um, it, wow. it was 90, probably 97, probably 1997. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Just the, you're on the forefront of things um, before people really needed to be. So educational collaborators grew into a bigger entity than just six. What did, what does EC, what did, what did EC do back then? And what does it do now? Um, I know the answer, but maybe other people might not. <laughs> Yeah, sure. No, good. It's a good question because I kind of skipped over that because I spent so much time on the background stuff. But the um, <laughs> but um, so when it was just six of us, it was really more more of a proof of concept than a real company, right? Like we just wanted to experience and explore whether or not six people working full time in schools from different places could actually serve as a relevant consultant virtually to another client. And so our first big deal, we intentionally used somebody from, it was actually in the town that I lived, but I didn't want to be the project lead because I intentionally wanted to test this online model. So um, I asked, uh, Kurt Leinick was the tech director at University of Chicago Lab School and one of our first six collaborators. And I asked him to be the project lead in specifically because he wasn't physically close. And, and, and it would force us to use those online models. and and. The funny thing was, <clears throat> we all knew each other. It was six people, and I, I basically hired six of my closest friends because I knew that if this company was a, if this startup was a disaster, all it would take is a beer and a good night of conversation, and all would all would be gone, right? All badness would be gone. So, um, so I, I intentionally started with these friends. Well, we all knew each other, and we and we. And we shared stories with one another. We asked one another for help in our own jobs all the time. What I and I knew that putting the six of us together for a third party client would would yield some benefits, right? I mean, six brains are better than one, right? What I didn't realize is how amazingly valuable it would be to each of us. You see, I thought I knew those other five folks pretty well. But the reality was, if I felt like I had my arms around something, I didn't ask them because I didn't want to bother them while they're doing their jobs with things that I thought that I knew pretty well. But the reality was they knew like way better ways to do the stuff that I thought I knew how to do well. And so by collaborating and putting these, all of these ideas to better, to, together and everyone sort of putting their best idea forward, not only was it amazingly powerful for the client school, it was amazingly powerful for us and our own schools. And, <clears throat> and that's when I realized, oh, wow, we're actually sitting on something that is bigger and better than I realized. So I needed to learn a whole lot of stuff about running a business like super fast. So I had to go find an investor so that I could bring in a full-time salesperson. And I brought in somebody that I knew from uh, not IBM Global Services, but the IBM education side uh, to come in and be my co-founder and, and, and run sales because I was working during the day. Well, you got to sell to schools during the day because that's where they are, but I had another job. So brought him in to do that. Um, <clears throat> And we started to expand our network. It now has over 140 educators um, as part of our network that do this, this solution for schools. And I realized that the real secret sauce for us was to listen to what the school's challenges are, try to understand the, the problem, not only from a technical side and a tool side, but also a cultural side and a political side um, and a human side. And that gave me the ability to kind of pick and choose the right collaborators to put together on a team to then go work with the school. And, and, and I just kind of learned that when you get the right people involved, 
and, 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 and people are willing to listen and be genuine and work together, I don't, I don't have to worry about it. I put the right people together, put them in touch with the school. I work on sort of designing the model so that everybody knows what the parameters are and the costs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then once that happens, it, it's good luck, Godspeed. And I have no concerns because good people make good things happen. And that's, that's how we, that's how we did it and grew that from six to 140. And now like Lenovo resells our services, HP resells our services, uh, resellers all over the country that don't have training teams and consultants resell our services through distribution services. Um, and then um, strategically STS wanted that to be part of their core educational technology solution. And so that's when the acquisition occurred and it just made good sense. The other piece of this that I think that is really important is that people who, I think most of the people here are independent school people, but there might be a few people who aren't. I think the, the a lot of your work has been with independent schools, but it's expanded. But I think a lot of that camaraderie and knowledge sharing um, was really evident in the independent school world through the independent school listserv. Mm. And, and I, I've learned so much from that listserv for the past, I don't know, I probably joined it in 2000, maybe. Um, it's now run by Atlas, which is the independent school tech group. Um, but that's kind of like that spirit that you're talking about with this, your six original collaborators is kind of what I've felt all along. Like everybody's willing to help each other out and um, just really, really strong, um, helpful people in that group in, in general. To totally. I mean, quite frankly, it's what gave birth to my company, right? Because the people, those original six are all people that I met through IS, ISDL, right? Through that, through that listserv. And so, um, and I read that listserv every day and I, yeah. I posted to it this morning. Um, and so, yeah, yeah I, I'm a, I'm a fan of, I'm just a fan of community, right? And so, you know, what we tried to create with educational collaborators, you know, independent of the work that we do for other schools, our base camp, we try to cultivate as much of a community as we can um, through our online uh, project management portal, through events when we just get together. And I love pulling people together and I also love to party at conferences. And so um, <clears throat> all just a good excuse, but it's all because I love community. And, um, and so, um, IS, ISDL, the Independent School uh, Education Listserv, um, that 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 was an online community, the earliest online community, and it taught me how to be a tech director. Um, and so that's that's where I built the network that really kind of came from that. And yeah, now uh, you know, independent schools are there's kind of a disproportionate amount. They're only about thirty percent of the work that we do, but that's still disproportionately large because um, they're not thirty percent of the education marketplace. Um, and so, but we, we do a lot of, a lot of work in that, in that community, but, but all, you know, is where I mentioned Lenovo and HP, we're also a top tier partner with Google and Microsoft. And so we work with them on their strategic accounts. And so those are, you know, their strategic accounts are all basically large public districts, right? None of the independent schools or charter schools are sort of large enough to sort of meet, be strategic when you're the size of Google and Microsoft, right? And so, um, so we work with them on those accounts as well. Um, and it's a joy. I mean, great educators are great educators in any kind of environment. And it's fun for us to learn with them when we do our work with them, when we collaborate to use my overused word. <laughs> and amplify. Um, <laughs> to amplify our collaboration. <laughs> So, so the, so the, so the, the STS part of the equation now, um, I had the opportunity to, to have a, to work on a project out in, in California this summer, last summer, um, where I had to, I got to meet some of the STS team and they also seem like really great people. Like that's another theme here, like high quality people to, to help you do this work. Tell us a little bit about STS's history, what, what they do. Um, and how EC is going to kind of uh, fit into it, how it's fitting into that um, their 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 vision for education. Yeah, if it's all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna recontextualize and broaden your question even just a little bit. I'm gonna answer that, but I want to broaden that a little bit 
because um, one of the things that as tech directors, you are all dealing with, um, and I dealt with as a tech director, but you're dealing with in a much more amplified way, and, and I wanted to use that word intentionally, Don, uh, is, uh, is mergers, right? There is a ton of consolidation happening in the ed tech space right now, right? And, um, you know, in some cases, it's just acquisitions. In some cases, it's these multiple large acquisitions that are turning into whole new companies like Bloom, right? And, uh, and so, uh, you know, Amplified IT just got acquired by um, CDW, not just, but within the last year. Um, there is, you know, power schools been buying up everyone that they can consume. There, there is a lot of consolidation happening right now in the ed tech market. I don't know that it's a bad thing. It's, it's, it's just sort of a natural thing that comes with maturing um, industries. And ed tech is now very much a mature uh, industry. It's 20, 20 years old. It's, it's real. Um, we weren't looking to sell um, because the, the pandemic brought about, first, it actually killed all business in ed, ed tech. And then it, then it just exploded in, in all of ed tech. So everybody in ed tech was super busy. Um, and so there were some companies that were that that struggled to make that transition into um, pandemic. Their their solutions really weren't relevant to the pandemic world, and some of that acquisition was because they needed a modernization. In our case, I mean, we were a company that was born online, served online, collaborated online. The pandemic was sort of built for us. Just took you know once people started buying again, it was it was a good fit for us, but. But that is sort of short-lived, um, that this, this consolidation was going to absolutely outlast the pandemic. And so we kind of had our eye on that horizon to say, who's the right kind of fit for us? And so we had some time to think about that kind of before pandemic. And, and a colleague of mine, uh, um, who's, uh, I can go, I, it's not, this isn't an NDA thing, I can say it. So a colleague of mine, Elliot Levine, was actually serving as their, as STS's chief academic officer for a short period of time before um, he was kind of, had his eye out to get back at Global. He was chief academic officer at HP. Um, then at the beginning of the pandemic, they laid off a ton of people. He left just before that and, and became the chief academic officer at STS. And now he's the worldwide director of education for um, uh, Qualcomm. And uh, in that in-between spot, when he knew that he was going to be heading out to Qualcomm, he said, are you looking to be acquired? And I said, not, not seriously. And he says, yeah, you, you, you should be. And, and I want you to look at STS. And, uh, and so, so I did. And, and we had that conversation um, with them. And what uh, the reason why I kind of backed that question up really is sort of necessary background for the why we keep why STS? Um, because there's a lot of money flowing into ed tech right now. And that's not always a good thing for the consumers. It, it can be, but it isn't always. And, and so with all of this consolidation that's happening, I think it's really important to ask the people that you've been working with that either bought or, or, or were bought um, as part of this consolidation, why, why did you do this? Um, and, and what's, why does this make sense for us? And listen real carefully for the answer. Um, because some of this acquisition is happening for money and money alone. And, and they're businesses. And I get that. I mean, they're in businesses to make money. So I, I don't fault them for that. But that doesn't necessarily serve you as a tech director, right? When when I first met with Mark Netka, the CEO of, of STS Education, and he shared his vision to become more of a comprehensive ed tech solution, that, that they made a commitment early on to only work with K-12 education. And so when they, when they call themselves STS Education, it's not because education is a division of a larger STS that serves accounting firms and hospitals and businesses. And no, it's they only serve education. And he said, we can't just sell stuff. Like selling stuff doesn't help them use it. And, and we can't sell them the right thing 
unless they know how everything sort of fits into their larger picture. And we only know what we sell them. What we are seeking is a more comprehensive solution to help schools on the planning side, the strategy side, the service side, the installation side, and the professional development side. And then, and then on the refresh, right? Get, get rid of this stuff, but get value out of it and then get the new stuff all within a strategy. I can't do that without you guys. And that vision is so consistent with what I needed as a tech director and what I had sought educational collaborators to someday become. And we both realized that this was an opportunity for us both to expand our vision and catalyze our vision to really help schools create that total solution. Um, and so, so that, that's why we did that. Um, they didn't use outside funding to get it. Um, we worked together, we created a, a, a great solution um, without having to sort of, you know, pay the financial masters um, who are, who can be part, who can have undue influence uh, in what these, what this consolidation is becoming. And so, um, so they, uh, they were a refurber and then a reseller. And now they really are much more of a comprehensive solution. We've acquired another company since then that does more of the engineering and install and managed service providing um, services. So, so really we, we are the strategy, the stuff, the labor to install, the labor to maintain, um, the talent and skill to, to you know, tie this to your program, the ability to do the professional development, the ability to get your residual value um, on the stuff when it goes away and make sure that it's all disposed of safely and securely. Um, and, and it's exciting. I, like, it's exciting because it's like being a tech director and a business owner, like all at the same time. And I, I love it. I, I, I love it. That's so great to hear. And I, I think, I don't know very many companies that do this, that are this comprehensive. And I, I, I feel like schools need, um, sometimes they need a streamlined, so they need streamlined services so that they can get to the business of educating. Like, you know, maybe they don't necessarily have the internal people to make decisions or to do the PD or to do the strategic right. planning or whatever. Right. And, and so, um, you know, you know, if they can go to one place and get everything in one, one stop shopping, it seems like it would, it would help, particularly if, if schools are under resourced. I would think it would be um, particularly helpful. Well, actually, our sweet spot are districts five thousand and under. Now, we certainly work with uh, okay. plenty that are over, but um, uh, you know, and all independent schools, charter schools um, fall under that. I, I don't know of any independent or charter school. I know charter networks, but individual charter schools that are over five thousand. Um, so, so yeah. that's that's our that's our sweet spot. Actually, is those schools that kind of need more help because, you know, the, the one to three people that they have managing technology are wearing like 12 hats, right? And, mm -hmm. and sometimes you need expertise, but, you know, you can't hire, you can't bring in as a full-timer that, that expertise. You just need that, but you need that slice of expertise for this project that you're doing to make sure that you are getting the biggest bang for your buck, right? And so, we can do that. And, and it's just, it's exciting because also, I mean, yes, I've worked with school districts like Miami-Dade, Chicago Public Schools, Dallas ISD. I've worked with, with big ones before, um, but not as a full-time employee. My, my, most of my day-to-day -day school leadership experience has been in independent schools or small schools. And um, so I like helping the small schools. To me, it's, yeah, it's kind of where my heart is. So that was another yeah. reason why STS was a really good fit for us. That sounds awesome. It sounds like a great merger. So um, I'm going to take the spotlight off of us a little bit and we can move to Q&A and have people grab the mic in a second. Um, but here's, I guess, you know, one, another thing that we've talked about too with our guests has been like how people have fared during the pandemic. And I think you fare, you were busy, it sounds like. Um, but and also, like, what do you see coming out of the pandemic for schools? What are some of the trends? What are some of the observations that you have about where schools are at? Uh, Don and I have been talking a lot about how risk averse we think schools have become. 
and and I'm wondering if you're seeing that. So anything you want to address uh, along those lines, and then we can move into Q and A with, with from people. Yeah. So I see a tale of two cities in in as as schools come out of the pandemic, and um, I absolutely see the the risk averse schools, and I, and I see that the schools that are recognizing the kind the fact that. Their teachers have made like 10 years of professional growth with technology in the last um, two years, right? And so some schools I am seeing embracing this and, uh, and, and, and doing a lot of the things that I think they're going to need to in this post-pandemic world. And those are the trends. And I'll get to those in just a minute. Okay. Um, and I see some schools, too many and probably more than not, who they're tired. I mean, and they're tired for all the right reasons. And I get it because they, because they've worked tirelessly over the last two, three years, two years rather to meet students and families where they are, but they're exhausted. So are parents um, because they're dealing with pandemic in their own ways and their own businesses and their own challenges. And everyone's exhaustion has us treating one another like crap. And, yeah. and, and, and that that exhaustion combined by that lack of understanding, listening, and respect is creating environments that are entirely unconducive for progressive change, right? And so, um, so I don't, I don't, I don't fault the communities that are feeling resistant to change, but God, they are missing an opportunity that is unlike any they have been handed and any they are likely to be handed in the next 20 years. And so um, I understand, I get it, um, but I, I hope we can all find ways around this uh, to take advantage of the amazing opportunities. And, and some of the opportunities that are flying in our face, whether you like them or not, that we have to respond to are the sort of trends that I see. Um, one is cybersecurity. Schools went from, uh, one of the most attacked environments to the most attacked by like a factor of four versus other uh, industries. Schools that are not responding to cybersecurity needs are putting their staff and students at risk and, and we have to recognize it and deal with it in wholly new ways. The government is beginning to recognize the support that they're gonna need to do, but just the, just the murmurings that I'm hearing out of Washington are, um, in my opinion, not even close to what schools are going to need, but step in the right direction. Um, schools, a lot of schools that didn't have virtual school options, like year-round virtual school options, now have them. Um, but they're um, and 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 the, those that had them grew them. But very very few are taking the time to actually look at the data and ask how many of their students actually did better in the pandemic in virtual learning than they did in class. The superintendents, I talked to a bunch of superintendents um, last week, or excuse me, earlier this week, and those that had looked at the data saw that it was 20 or 20% 20 or more of their students actually performed better in virtual environments. And post pandemic, less than 5% of their students are, are capable of doing full-time virtual. So we're gonna have to figure that out. And once we start taking, if you think about taking 20% of your students out of physical class and moving them to virtual class, massive infrastructure opportunities associated with something like that, right? So amazing thing and, and programmatic opportunities. So that's a, a second trend. The third trend is my son is interested, my son's a sophomore in high school, interested in being a teacher, doing the college runs. The number of schools that said, that apologized for the shrinking size of their colleges of education broke my heart. I mean, I knew it as an industry, but to hear college admissions officers say that to the very few kids that are actually interested in going into education just broke my heart. Um, and staffing is going to, staffing was going to be a problem for us anyway, regardless of pandemic, but the way we're treating one another has made it way, way worse. And so we got a lot to figure out there. Um, as a as a 
company that serves education, we really ramping up and, and expanding our service offerings because we think schools are going to need it. I, and and not, not think, we know schools can't hire the people that they need. They're taking their academic tech people and pulling them in the classrooms because they don't have the teachers. And then, uh, so we want to be that sort of overlay that can be, fill the roles that those people that you need um, but don't have because either they left your school or you had to pull them into the classroom. We're trying to meet those needs because we see that as being huge. Okay, that was kind of a long answer. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, and I think really important food for thought. So cybersecurity, teacher shortage, um, what was that? And virtual one? ed, virtual ed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I've and i heard that from a super, uh, an assistant superintendent around here in Illinois who they were planning to do a virtual school in this district before the pandemic. And then the conversation stopped after the pandemic or during the pandemic. And like, yep. you know, people are kind of going in the reverse now, yep. um, but he still thinks it's relevant in that, you know, I think my, <clears throat> I think for my kids, they did pretty well with virtual I, forever. I don't know if it's a, the best thing for them. Um, my son in, in, in at community college right now is taking, um, some courses and it hasn't been a great experience to be I, I think the other thing that we haven't really talked about too is um how do you you know what does good online teaching look like i, I don't oh, think yeah. there's been enough discussion about that uh, about what student engagement looks like and you hold know on. in one of the hold on i gotta plug a book i don't know if, it, if okay. you'll be able to see it with the uh um, the i can't see it with no, the blur on no. um so uh, so one of our collaborators, Lindy Hockenberry, wrote a teacher's guide yeah. to online learning, and it yeah. is fantastic. It is really? just super practical. Um, it, it's it's very it, it's it's very in the weeds for a teacher to try to understand from a practice standpoint how to uh, how to create good online learning. So some great resources, good interviews in in this book. Um, so yeah, I and I couldn't agree more because the reality was. We didn't, the online learning that we did during the pandemic was not actually a representation of online learning. It was a representation of typical traditional learning delivered through online tools. That's different. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and so these, the, and, and that's why I think many districts kind of went back, if it, you know, to the small to zero virtual programs. I mean, in Texas, you can't even have a virtual program. And, and, and I think that's criminal if yeah. you've got students who perform better in that environment and, and they've got to have data on that, there's got to be good data on that. So, yeah. and I don't fully understand the Texas law because I know people that like Chris Bigginhoe who work with the online schools that various Texas depart, uh, Texas mm -hmm. districts had prior to pandemic. So I know that, I, I know that that's possible. It existed. And yeah. I, and I would, and, and I don't think virtual education is for everyone. I really don't, but for those for whom it is, tr designing truly online learning environments is, is, I think, crucial and necessary for a significant population of our students. Absolutely. Anybody yeah, hey, else Alex, have some... Oh, yeah, I go for it, Dan. Yeah, so uh, Alex, um, my theory is that the reason faculty are exhausted is the very point that you made that they took this offline experience and are trying to do the exact same thing online and you have to redesign and that's the dissonance problem it just, just doesn't and but, but totally. it's, i've had a really hard time convincing people to redesign and and i say that because i teach a, a graduate class in design thinking at teachers college columbia biggest edu uh university in the country um and um we went right into the pandemic and you know tried to do what we were doing before that and i knew straight away and so literally rashan and i my co-professor we redesigned it and when we came back physically we didn't throw everything out of that redesign because elements of that redesign yeah. work really really good so yeah. we have every third class is synchronous because it just works better we don't need to be there um and so like this is the thing but it's been just a hard to try and explain this to people because they they just want to they don't want to do the redesign they want to take what they have and put it on and then the second thing about the shortage of teachers um lucy and i have a academic tech friend who was pushed back in to teach math because of what you're saying 
And I'll tell you that in the class I teach, and it's just a small amount of, it's 23 students, um, I would say barely 50% of them are going to go into education. And when I started out teaching this 10 years ago, all 23 were, wanted, were doing masters of teachers. That is no longer the case. Yeah. So that sort of confirms a bit what bit of evidence what you're saying. Yeah. So it, what are they going to what are they going to do, Don? What are they going to do with an education master's degree? Communication. And, I, don't think, and I, I no, I don't think it's about the degree. It's about the university brand. So it, oh. it doesn't really matter what the degree is in, you know, <laughs> pretty much. Wow. If you have wow. a Columbia University brand is well, so strong. Um, so and and let, these are my theories, Alex. Just some yeah, being on I, the ground. There. So I I I I believe that, and and I don't think people who are, um, I, I you know that's Columbia, right? I mean that that's a strong strong brand, right? To have on your on your resume. Uh, I I think in a lot of other colleges they're just not showing up in the education school at all, and and I do see, and and I'm I am guilty of this very complaint that I'm about to make, um, and that's that. This consolidation is and, and these needs in the classroom are requiring businesses to hire more educators to move into these roles, right? And 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 I'm interviewing people for a position that I have open right now that are in schools today. And I'm gonna hire the best person for the job, but it breaks my heart to be contributing to an environment that pulls people out of schools. I mean, the reality is they're only interviewing with me because they're ready to leave anyway. Right. And they're going to, and they're going to leave at the end of the year and go do something. But, um, but man, it just, I would, we need to find, we as an ed tech industry need to find ways to su support people in the schools and keep them in the schools. That's one of the things I was actually always proud of with educational collaborators is we took really, really, really talented people at the top of their game who could leave education and make a lot more money someplace else. And they stayed in schools because educational collaborators gave them the ability to continue to follow their passion, which was their school, make some extra money, get the professional growth that they needed, but they stayed in the school. The challenge and what's different now is School environments have become hostile enough, certainly not all, but some environments have become hostile enough. They don't have that passion to stay in the school. That's not the anchor. I was only feeding their anchor. Their anchor isn't in their school anymore. And that's, you know, I, 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 I don't know how to solve this problem, but boy, I sure hope we can find a solution to, to get that back so that these teachers, these amazingly talented people who have always been worth more than what schools could pay them, can find that anchor and passion in the school again. Hey, Alex, can you stick around for a couple more minutes? I mean, we're, it's two o'clock. Do, do you have a hard stop right now? Nope, or I'm you, happy to stay with you. Minutes. Minutes. You bet. Okay. Uh, Alex Pachowski, do you have a question? Do you want to offer your insights? Oh, I was saying? just going to jump in. I think every, I'm, I, I could just nod yes to just about everything Alex is saying. We've had some of these conversations before. <laughs> I think the the bigger picture and the 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 bigger danger is how we're going to end up adapting to these teacher shortfalls and this ed ed, ed tech consolidation and the concept of of turning the school into more of a reactionary to what's going on in the market yeah. versus being the innovation that it has to be in order to continue to drive. Um, Ed tech products pop up because there's an idea and a need to do something. And I think the biggest piece of, of the biggest danger we have is that those who are going to worry, who are going to be the inner innovators, those who are going to be in the classroom and driving those ideas and coming up with that next generation of tools and, and directions and everything else might skip the school entirely. And I think that part, like I was just saying, like he, he's torn by having teachers you know, by hiring teachers. I've been talking with, with teachers at my school and other schools all year about how they they don't know how to attack how to attack the job market because they've always been a teacher. They don't know how to prepare a resume and do an interview and do things that 
you know, most, most people just take nap, think, think naturally. And, and I think that like, because this education schools are not driving, although like I agree, teachers college in Columbia, like you just put that on a resume somewhere, just to take one class, you'll get hired no matter what. <laughs> um, but, but I think that's really that, that danger in, we're not gonna have the innovators in the classroom anymore. They're just all gonna be on the outside looking in. And I think that's, that, as Alex was saying, that, is the, that was the strength of collaborators, is the strength of collaborators, is that you've got the practitioners who are in the schools, who are seeing what the groundwork is and can make the commentary on, this is what's really going on when they use this product or when we're approaching something from this perspective. And if we lose that, education's really in trouble. Yep, I, I, I totally agree. So I think it's about rethinking the, the career path of educators too. Like I think the idea of staying in one school for 30, 40 years um, is, is, is not tenable. I mean, for some people. And, and, and so like, what does it look like? You know, could I go back and be a second grade teacher now again? I mean, I would be exhausted. Could I do it? Yes. But like it was, I was better suited when I was in my twenties and thirties to be that that energetic teacher, yeah. right? And 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 devoting every waking hour to planning and that sort of thing. Um, and now I think, and as, as people have families, they, that kind of lifestyle of planning, you know, lesson planning all weekend is not tenable. Um, so like you know, maybe people who are have families move into coaching roles or start moving up the administration chain or whatever it is. I think, I think we need to coach teachers to think about what the different iterations of their career can be, and just because, just because you're not necessarily in a classroom doesn't mean that you can you can't contribute to the field of education. Like I I, I feel okay. I look at myself as kind of a non traditional educator, because um, I'm doing it in different ways. Um, so it's, it's interesting. We just really, I think the structures that are in place, like I know in Michigan, for instance, I think, I think it's Michigan. You can't really transfer from one district to another without like having super serious repercussions to your pension. Um, you know, there's certain things like that that get in the way of, of, of letting teachers feel like they have some freedom to choose their own destiny. You know? Yeah. I, I, I agree with that as well. The, the, the part that, concerns me the most though is um, our, our school communities, our educational communities still need to be the kind of place that draw and, and um, that draw educators and still inflame their passions, right? And we, we've, we've got to transition out of this um, chasing our tails, exhausting ourselves, running in circles kind of thing. And, and into uh, what Alex was describing as more of sort of a, let's redesign what it is that we want and, and, and pull forward. That, that, that's going to keep, what we need is that anchor so that if you're leaving because of life skills, that's fine, but your anchor is still in the schools, right? If you're, if you're leaving because of, of uh, you know, family challenges, fine, but, but your anchor is still in those schools, right? Um, I just want to make sure that we continue to find and feed ways for educational communities to be that uh, locus of passion. I think that's kind of like the perfect note to end on. I love that. That's a really good um, way to look at it. Uh, I want to thank you again, Alex, for your time. I'll have the recording up at the tonight, hopefully, and then I'll do some show notes for it over the weekend uh, with some of the resources that we've talked about and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I, I think you're in a really unique position in the work that you're doing to see what's going on in schools right now. And so that's why I wanted to have you here because I think, I thought you could give us some insight into what you're seeing in terms of trends and, and things that we need to be aware of going forward as educators and non-traditional educators. So thanks again, Alex. I really appreciate your time. Uh, Don, me. you want to say anything? Yeah. Alex, Don, what was the book you recommended? What's it called? It's called a, a teacher's guide to online learning. Right. And I put the, it? I put the, and the, and the link. Yeah. I see Lucy put the chat or oh, the okay. link for it Great. in the chat. It's Thanks. Linda, Lindy Hockenberry. Yep. All Full right. disclosure, Lindy's uh, one of our collaborators, but she's uh, also just amazing. 
She's she's right. phenomenal. She's a phenomenal collaborator and amplifier. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to amplify the access to Lindy's book and collaborate with her on this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna start.